Welcome, I'm Jeremiah Reiner, and this is the Deeply Rooted Podcast. Hey there, welcome to the Deeply Rooted Podcast. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jeremiah Reiner, your host. We appreciate you guys tuning in and giving us a listen. Don't forget to head on over and hit that subscribe button. Give us a like on our YouTube channel and on Apple Podcasts. Leave us a review. That'd be a great help to us moving forward. You can also find us on our Facebook group page. You can email us at drigw18 at gmail.com. And you can head on over to our website, deeplyrootedpodcast.com. You're going to see blog posts, archived episodes, and upcoming ministry schedule as well. We've been hitting the road a little bit harder lately on promoting the upcoming Deeply Rooted Conference. That's going to be November 10th and 11th here in Kingsport, Tennessee. We're excited to tell you that we have landed a location. Uh, We're going to be at Grace Point Fellowship there in Kingsport, Tennessee for The conference this year, we're excited to be bringing in Brother Mike Abendroth and some others as well, some familiar faces if you were there with us last year. And we're going to be looking at the doctrine of assurance. And so it should be a great topic to dive into. And we're really excited about the upcoming conference. So please be sure to register. You can do that on our website, deeplyrootedpodcast.com. Again, just reminding you there, you'll be able to register there, you, yourself, many others, invite the whole church if you'd like to. Any young children are going to be able to get in for free, but we really would appreciate if you would go ahead and register them as well and get them a ticket. A multi-day event, we're hoping to be sending out the schedule sooner than later, so we'll be able to let you know the rundown of who's going to be speaking and when and what times and all those fun things. So again, November 10th and 11th, Grace Point Fellowship, Kingsport, Tennessee, the second deeply rooted conference looking at the doctrine of assurance. So if you haven't done so, head on over to the website and make sure you sign up there. Register. Should be a good time this fall, just like we had last year. So that being said, uh, looking at the idea of assurance, I want to talk about something today, uh, looking at what is real biblical salvation, Uh, That term gets thrown out a lot, I believe, but we want to look at it from the actual text here this this episode, and so just looking at the idea of biblical salvation here, and so um, I'm curious, as this quote here by George Whitfield, I've always liked this, he said, I say salvation is the free gift of God. It's God's free grace that I preach unto you, not of works, lest anyone should boast, quoting out of Ephesians 2, which we're going to look at here in just a moment. He said, Jesus Christ justifies the ungodly. Jesus Christ passed by, saw you polluted with your blood, and bid you live. I love that line there. I think in its most simple form, salvation just simply means to be saved. And that term, to be saved, if you look at it, it it means by definition to be rescued from a dangerous or threatening situation. That's exactly what's happening. This is precisely what it means to be saved, and that's what it's all about. And the role of Savior is belongs exclusively to Jesus Christ. And the question of salvation is actually the supreme and ultimate question of all the Bible and human history. Of all the things that you could be identified as, the most important one by far is, are you born again? So therefore, let's look at the scripture and see what it has to say about this all-important doctrine. Looking at Ephesians 2, and if you want to pull that up, that'd be a great time to hop in there and uh, join up with us if you'd like to. But Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writing here to the church uh, at Ephesus, and he comes upon this second chapter here in such a, uh, a manifesto, so to speak, about biblical salvation, grace through faith. A lot of your headings probably in your Bible will say that. I want to read these 10 verses here and really take a deeper look at biblical salvation from this passage. Paul writes again here, second chapter of Ephesians. And you were dead in trespasses and sin. That's very important. In which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Verse 4, powerful. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which... He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, 
He's raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I just simply want to look at four major things here out of this passage in looking at biblical salvation. Number one, biblical salvation means to be truly regenerate. And we're talking about real transformation here. We're not talking about behavior modification. This is not turning over a new leaf or getting some things organized in your life or becoming a better version of you. We hear that lingo all the time. We're talking about being altogether new. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul, the same one here who wrote in Ephesians, would write to the Corinthian church, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, there it is, not in and of ourselves, not in some other way, form, or fashion, but to be in Christ, he is a new creature. Again, not a modified creature, but a new creature. The rest of that verse says, Old things are passed away. Not slightly, not some, and not even most, but old things are passed away. Behold, all things are are become new. Now, I think it's important to understand how this happens. This is not some type of science project or a product of discipline therapy. Uh, Historically, this is what we would refer to as the ordo salutis. Now, that's just a fancy Latin word that we would use for the order of salvation. Using Paul here still in Romans 8 verse 30, Uh, He gives us an excellent verse here in regard to the order of salvation. He says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. They're referring to God here. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Paul condenses the entire process down for us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by explaining to us the order. And simply put, we would just walk you through this very clearly. Uh, Number one, God's call produces regeneration in us. Uh, We hear many calls uh, to be saved, but in and of ourselves, in our natural form, we reject most of those. Um, I'm a minister, and I promise you this, there have been many, many, many times in my life that I have called people to repentance, and they have certainly rejected my voice, but they cannot reject the effectual call of the Holy Spirit. And so God's call produces regeneration in us. Secondly, this causes us to cry out in repentance and faith. These are both gifts of God. This is the order in which this is going to take place. And ultimately, this results in justification. Now you've been justified in the eyes of God, not through your own work, obviously, but through the finished work of Jesus Christ. This would lead to sanctification, This is the working out of our salvation in our lives here and certainly becoming more and more and more like Jesus Christ as the days and years go by. And then ultimately glorification uh, when we make our way into heaven, our eternal reward, and all things are made right in a glorified body. They're worshiping the Lord forever. And so that's a simple process there of ordo salutis. Now, the, the point to be made is this. All of this, all of this is a gift of God to spiritually dead people. I go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You were dead in trespasses and sins, he said, which you once walked following the course of this world. In other words, we pursued us. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We were spiritually dead. It says we followed the prince and power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. He wrote in verse 3, we lived in the passions of our flesh. We carried out the desires of our body. We were by nature, this is how we were born, children of la- of wrath, excuse me, like the rest of mankind. But there's verse 4. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love which we have, he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us, there it is, we had nothing to do with that, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And so again, to be spiritually say biblical salvation is to be truly regenerated, completely, altogether new. Now, the second point, biblical salvation also means, and and I'm just going to put this very plainly, to be truly saved. 
Jonathan Edwards with a great line here. He said, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. Boy, is that not the truth. Uh, This is God's full work from beginning to end. I want to go to verse 8 there in Ephesians 2 as Paul follows up. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Again, there's more ordo salutis for us. And this is not of your own doing. That is so vital for all people to understand. It is the gift of God. And folks, you do not need a Greek lexicon to understand what that means. You cannot in any way, shape, and form take credit for your own salvation. It is the gift of God. Verse 9, not a result of works. Now, he is meaning your works. Because there was a work done, and it was done only and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9 goes on to say, So that no one may boast. The only one who can take credit for salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So again, truly being saved, as Edward says, is a product of God Almighty doing the impossible in your life. And the only thing we brought to the table was the sin that made it necessary for us to be saved. Therefore, we have got to stop committing this spiritual robbery. No one should ever be taking credit for their salvation. It's arrogant and it's theologically false. Romans 3, beginning in verse 10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Again, it goes back to what Edward said. The only thing we bring is sin to the table. Paul wrote there to the Romans very clearly. We're not seeking after God. We have no righteousness in and of ourselves. We are unprofitable. We do no good whatsoever. Therefore, we must be born again. I think of the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He looks him right in the eye, a very, very religious man. Nicodemus, no doubt, what you and I would call a moral man. But the Lord Jesus Christ, face to face, looks at him and says in John chapter 3, verse 7, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. And I think this leads to a very vital question that has to be pondered. When we're talking about being saved, being born again, I think it's only natural to ask the question, being saved from what? Now, I think there's actually two Old Testament uh, depictions here that are great illustrations of this that I want to tie in. One is of the days of Noah. Scripture tells us in the days of Noah that people were eating and drinking and being given in marriage, and God had given a clear decree to Noah to build the ark. He and his family, judgment is coming. People have been warned wickedness abounds, righteousness is scarce, and God is telling him he is making a way for him to be saved. And then the rains come. People are wiped out. Noah and his family are saved. The Bible literally says that the door is sealed by God himself, a great illustration there of salvation. It was God's idea. God carried out the work. He gave him the means to be able to do that. God provided everything, and the people simply rejected that, and wrath came. And that is the point. They were being saved from the wrath of God. The other story in the Old Testament, I think, points this out, is the story of Jonah. Uh, The city of Nineveh, just like in the days of Noah, wicked, carnal, filthy, awful, sinful people, And God calls Jonah to go down and preach to these people. Now, Jonah very reluctantly does not want to go. He's got discrepancies here against these people of Nineveh. He's got bitterness in his heart. He's got hatred, and God continues to work on him. Jonah runs. He begins to run down to the local ships there. They get out on the sea. They eventually toss him overboard, and I'm thinking that, you know, Jonah's the one that's bringing this about. Of course, he's swallowed by a great fish, and for three days and three nights, He wrestles there, and God brings him to repentance. It is a gift of God for Jonah. Not only would the city of Nineveh be saved, Jonah himself needed to be saved. Jonah goes into the city of Nineveh after he spit up there on the dry ground and begins to preach to these people that they must turn and repent. 
They must turn to God. They do. They are spared from judgment, and that is the point again. What are they saved from? They are saved from the wrath of God. So I would put it to you this way when someone asks, saved from what? Well, salvation is a gift of God, by God, from God, and for God. To put it another way, salvation is of God because it's a gift of God. We didn't earn it. Salvation is by God because it's a finished work of Him. He sent His only begotten Son. He lived the perfect sinless life in our place. He died an atoning death. He was buried in a grave that should have been ours. He resurrects it and to oh, excuse me, He resurrects and therefore offers us eternal life, pardoned from sin. So salvation, gift of God, finished work of God, but salvation is also from God because it's being saved from the wrath of God. And then ultimately, it is for God. Salvation is for God because it brings glory to God. And the byproduct of all this is for our great eternal good, which we have not earned, did not deserve, but in grace we have been given this. The love of God abounds towards all people that have been saved. Thirdly, And this is the, again, simple byproduct of salvation. Biblical salvation means to be truly disciples. We're not talking about fans of Jesus here. This isn't something casual. I would say to people often, this isn't a buffet line. We don't just pick and choose which parts of salvation and serving God seem to fit our so-called lifestyle. Verse 10 there, back in Ephesians 2, He says, for we are his workmanship. Here it is, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should, here it is, walk in them. This is the natural thing that will occur when someone is saved. Jesus spoke of this early to his disciples in John 14, uh, verse 15, when he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is very simple. People who are saved will desire to follow Jesus Christ. It's a simple order. Uh, This is not a decision that somebody simply makes. This isn't some type of mentality or uh, ministry tactic that we can coerce people into. As a matter of fact, coercing anybody, that type of mentality, forcing people uh, to produce some type of behavior modification, I think that's led to a lot of false conversions. Uh, Such a danger in the modern church today. There's a good book out. It's called Conversion, and the subtitle is How God Creates a People. It's written by Michael Lawrence. It's part of the Nine Mark series on building healthy churches. I would encourage you to get those, particularly this one. I think Mr. Lawrence does a good job of laying out a very uh, basic, simple, and yet uh, well thought out um, work on the process of conversion. And uh, in page 53 and 54, I think he does a great job of outlining. What often occurs when we see false converts, uh, what he gives us here is some examples to think about, and I want to read some of these to you here because I think these are very interesting. So, for example, he says, what does a false convert look like? Often it's someone who, number one, is excited about heaven, but they're bored by Christians and the local church. Very sad, but that is true in many people. Second, They think heaven will be great whether God is there or not. Well, that is a a stain on modern Christianity that I've seen many, many times, and we've even seen it in song lyrics, uh, television form, movie form, many people talking about heaven and really disregarding if God is or is not there. Third, false converts tend to like Jesus, but they didn't sign up for the rest, such as obedience, holiness, discipleship, and at times suffering, if need be. He goes on to say, false converts can't tell the difference between obedience motivated by love or obedience motivated by legalism. There we get into um, law and grace, and very important that we understand uh, the difference there. But oftentimes, many people in the false convert crowd motivated out of legalism. Uh, The next one he says is those that are bothered by other people's sins far more than his or her own. Uh, That is such a uh, sad commentary on the false convert. And then finally, and I thought this was very poignant, false converts hold grace cheaply and their own comfort very costly. I think, sadly, this is probably plaguing the church today. It has become 
a devil's playground, really. People are dying in churches all over this nation and the world, assuming that they are right with God and on their way to heaven. And frankly, I don't think anything can be further from the truth. They're not disciples of the Lord, but I think they're disciples of a system that we've created. It's steeped in man-centered theology, and it believes in a Jesus. And I hate to say this, but it simply doesn't exist. And so again, I say biblical salvation means to be truly disciples, motivated simply by grace and the love which God has given us. It is the obvious, natural follow-up to conversion. And fourth and finally, biblical salvation means to be truly holy. The word holy is talking about being set apart. In a biblical sense, it really means to be under a new master. It means to be made new, not pieced back together due to your brokenness. Boy, there's a hot word in modern evangelicalism. We're not talking about brokenness. We're talking about being set apart here, being made new. Uh, It means to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, not being healed by some uh, emotional disappointment that you have. Folks will all be disappointed. There'll be disappointment even after you're saved. We're not being saved from that. We're being saved in loving God with all of our being. It means to die to yourself and the carnal nature that controlled you. Remember, he wrote there back again in Ephesians 2, this is who we were. We lived in the passions of our flesh. We carried out the desires of the body and the mind. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Biblical salvation, being truly holy, we've died to ourself in that nature. And we are not fulfilled anymore by, and this is very popular anymore, living our best life now. That's not what this is. Um, I'm reminded, going back to George Whitfield, a revival story from many years ago, Whitfield was known as this extremely powerful preacher. And many people at times made great professions of faith during some of his meetings, and I believe many people were saved. Uh, You refer to that time period really as the Great Awakening. There was one story in particular that Whitfield had finished in a series of messages he'd been preaching. It was said that many people repented and put their faith in Christ, and many people were talking about the salvations that occurred after those meetings. And as he made his way to the next town, one gentleman in particular came to Whitfield and asked him about the number of people that had been saved. And Whitfield, just turning to him, said, well, I don't know, but we'll find out in about six months. You know, that you may think that sounds harsh, but that's the honest-to-goodness truth. They'll be set apart, and we will know them by their fruit. We pray for them. We encourage them. We help disciple them. But at the end of the day, the Lord will showcase this, this to us. Uh, Christians produce genuine holiness, folks, through the work of the Spirit that now lives in them, and this holiness glorifies our Savior. That That is what biblical salvation is. It's living a life wholly separated to the glory of God for our good. And so, in conclusion, very simple here. Salvation is a free gift of God through the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's all grace and of no human effort whatsoever. We cannot save ourselves, but through the substitutionary death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we now have pardon from our sins before Almighty God, and we're adopted into His royal family forever. And ever. And so, in conclusion to that, I would like to read to you Psalm 103, verses 1 through 4. I think this is the uh, great culmination, really, of all saved people. The psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, and who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. What a beautiful picture of biblical salvation there in the psalmist, 103, verses 1 through 4. And I hope that you can take that with you. I hope that maybe answers some questions you have or maybe clarifies a few things that you've been pondering on. If you have more questions or or any more detail about this, you can email us at drigw18 at gmail.com. Don't forget to go on over to our website, deeplyrootedpodcast.com. Check out those blog posts. Make sure you register for the Deeply Rooted Conference this coming November. That'll be the 10th and 11th of November, Kingsport, Tennessee, Grace Point Fellowship. Looking for a good time there at the 
Doctrine of Assurance, as we study that for those two days there. And again, be on the lookout for new episodes. We're excited for a good summer lineup coming up ahead of you. We've got plenty lined up, so spread the word about that. If you haven't joined our Facebook group page, please do so. Uh, got a lot of things going on there and uh, a lot of moving and shaking, and so daily stuff put on there for your encouragement and thought, and uh, be a part of it. Comment, like, share, uh, get involved with other people and other listeners that you uh, may or may not know. And also, make sure that you tell other people about it. Uh, share this with friends and family. Word of mouth is always the best way to get this out. Maybe some fellow church members that might not be aware of the podcast. Well, I'm sure that they would appreciate hearing and uh, learning and listening to some insightful people. And we're looking forward to some of those interviews over the summer. And so stay on the lookout for that. But until next time, we love you guys, and we hope you have a great week in Jesus.